We overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other. Regardless what realm you're striving to achieve success in, you need to surround yourself with the right people. As the famous, and I love this man, John Wooden would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Gaynard here. Welcome to the Community Made Podcast. I want to start today's episode with a little bit of a a story of sorts, a pro blogger article that I came across back in 2011 called Four Words That Will Get Your Email Opened. That article cited a game-changing discovery by an email marketing automation platform called Aweber. If you're not familiar with Aweber, it would be similar to a MailChimp uh, or Constant Contact. And in their two and a half years of sending all kinds of emails to almost every kind of list you could imagine, they discovered that a simple four-word subject line worked brilliantly across a wide range of content from personal development to potty training to Viagra and virtually everything in between. And as Aweber counts each email that has been opened, and they even count when an email has been opened multiple times by the same person, they found that this single subject line had an average open rate of almost 90%, sometimes even surpassing 100%. That simple phrase was, you are not alone. Those four words resulted in the most open subject line they had ever seen by far. I use this example quite a bit when I give speeches because I think it it really demonstrates a cultural truth that many people don't acknowledge or address, and that's the fact that we are drowning in contacts, but absolutely starving for community. The rise of platforms like Facebook was was so sudden and have proven to be such a forceful distortion of our, our social space. I mean, having been relegated to our screens are our friendships now anything more than just a form of distraction i mean when these said friendships are are shrunken down to the size of a wall post do they do they actually retain any kind of content if we have 12,000 friends or 14,000 or 3,000 friends in some cases in what sense do we really have any i mean we post to facebook and i'm guilty of this as well like desperately seeking validation from strangers. We use Instagram to crowdsource our self-esteem. We inflate our job titles on LinkedIn to bring significance to our existence. And we fall into the trap of thinking we have a lot of friends because social media tells us so, right? I mean, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter have all caused most of us to collect contacts instead of actually building deep and genuine, authentic relationships. And few people actually stop to assess the actual strength of these so-called relationships. Conventional, I guess, networking gospel has left many with a breadth of relationships that have no real depth or meaning. Let me ask you this. I mean, have you ever, I've been guilty of this. Have you ever been, let's say at a mall and you see somebody who is a quote unquote Facebook friend and you kind of shy away or you know steer in the other direction so you don't have an actual kind of face-to-face conversation? There was a great book written almost 200 years ago called War and Peace. And there's a, a, a quote in that book that said, a numberless multitude of people of whom no one was close and no one was distant. I can say for me, most of the time, that's how I feel about navigating the society that we live in. I mean, we may feel that we are more connected than ever, but we see it time and time again that that's simply not the case. Keith Ferrazzi, who authored a a brilliantly named book called Never Eat Alone, wrote another book called Who's Got Your Back? And in researching that book, he shared with me a study that they conducted where they asked a wide range of participants one simple question, who has your back? Surprisingly, 50% of people felt like nobody had their back. Even more surprisingly, 60% of those people were married. Now we are experiencing a lack of belonging in droves and it is showing its effects everywhere. Today's children and teens are more depressed than ever before. According to suicide.org, 20% of all teens experience depression before they reach adulthood, and suicide is the third leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24. This is largely attributed by experts to be the cause of social isolation, a lack of community, and social media-induced anxiety and stress. 
In one of my all-time favorite books, Tribe by Sebastian Junger, he points out that even though only 10% of American armed forces ever see combat, cases of PTSD are now at a historic rise. Not because they have been, I guess, psychologically scarred by bloodshed on the battlefield, but because there's such a tight social cohesion during their time in the military that when they return home they are traumatized by that shift from the cohesion of that band of brothers or band of sisters to the social isolation that often comes with living in today's society. There are countless mental health, physical health, and longevity studies that prove time and time again that living disconnected lives is a dangerous health risk. In fact, there's a ton of research out there that shows that the secret to a long, healthy life is relationships. Consider the longest study of human life that's ever been done. It's the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Researchers have studied the lives of over 724 men over a period of 75 years, tracking key indicators like their work, their home life, finances, and so on to see what keeps people happy and healthy. 60 of those 724 men are alive and still participating in the study to this day, well into their 90s. Here is the current director of the Harvard study, Robert Waldinger, who explains his results and his findings in this TED Talk called, What Makes a Good Life? So what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives. Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us and that loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. And the third big lesson that we learned about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protective, that the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. Now, full transparency, this is just one of the many studies that really illustrates that a great life and a great business is built upon a foundation of deep and genuine relationships. I'm here to tell you that everything has changed, but nothing is different. We overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other. Regardless what realm you're striving to achieve success in, you need to surround yourself with the right people. As the famous, and I love this man, John Wooden would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And if you haven't started to consciously choose who you surround yourself with, it's time to start. I mean, Dan Sullivan has a philosophy that I love, which is for the first six years of your life, we're born into the world where everything is happening 
to us. And along the way, you start building relationships that are based purely on proximity. You are born into a family, you go to a specific school, you play a specific sport. You didn't really choose these relationships, they were somewhat chosen for you. And as time goes on, we start becoming conscious as to where we are, where we want to go. And all of a sudden, our new consciousness conflicts with our loyalty to these people that we never chose in the first place. We end up being very emotionally attached to these said relationships, obviously. And there comes a crucial point in life where you have to make a decision about where you want to allocate your energy. At some point, you will realize that as you choose your life more and more, you're also going to have to choose a different set of relationships. You can stay in touch with those from the past, but those individuals that you knew in the past generally won't be all that supportive of your future because to a certain extent, you're leaving them behind. There are people who you had relationships with that were important at a certain stage of your life to get to where you are. In a business context, I mean, this could even be said for certain team members or customers and clients, but what got you to where you are won't get you to where you want to go. Jim Collins, who wrote a fantastic book called Good to Great, talks a lot about having the right people on the bus. And ultimately, if you want to build an eight-figure business, you will need an eight-figure opportunity, you will need an eight-figure skill set, eight-figure structures, an eight-figure team, and eight-figure relationships. Upgrading your tribe is inevitable should you want to pursue growth in any area of your life. One question that I really love to pose to people and let them kind of sink it in is, are the current relationships in your life related to your past or related to your future growth? If you are continuing to grow and the people who you surround yourself with are not, there will come a time where a difficult choice will need to be made. You'll have three options ultimately, and I'll share more about those in a minute, but the hardest decision for most is to leave certain individuals behind. This notion leaves people very conflicted. And because of that, I thought I would share just a few things to consider. The first thing is that anything that doesn't grow dies. Anything that doesn't contribute gets eliminated. That's evolution. That's how we've survived as a species. And you hear me talking about our early kind of tribal life all the time. But as I made mention earlier, everything has changed, but nothing is different. Our tribal days, I mean, those that didn't contribute, those that were seen as liabilities, they were eliminated, right? They were left behind, especially in nomadic tribes. To me, growing is a lot like a muscle. Everyone is born with muscle and muscles continue to grow until you're about 30 years old. After 30, unless you proactively seek ways to grow through working out, every year you'll have less and less muscle. So if we're going to have muscle after the age of 30, then that muscle is there because we went to the gym to create it on some level. Now that's on a physical level, but on an emotional and psychological level, it's very much the same. When we're kids, we have a lot of structure and support in our lives that force us to grow. School, for example, right? But when we hit 25 and 30, it's almost like society says, all right, we've taken you as far as we can. Now, if you're going to have a future, you need to create it for yourself. And I mean, some people just don't catch on. And if you're having a hard time letting go of someone in your life who's not growth oriented, in my mind, they made the executive decision to go against nature and not continue to grow. Everything on this planet is designed to either grow or die. If you put blocks in front of a child with no instruction whatsoever, they will try to stack them, right? I mean, if you're pursuing growth in your life, you are simply fulfilling on what you're put on the planet to do. It's like that Benjamin Franklin quote that most people die at 25 and aren't buried until they're 75. If, if someone chooses to jump off that train and coast through their 20s, their 30s, or ultimately the rest of their life, that's totally fine. That's their decision. But don't feel guilty for continuing on this path called life. The second thing is, Let's be honest, time and energy are scarce, right? The beautiful thing about time is that it's universal. You could be born with access to more resources like money or a network, but time is universal. Bill Gates doesn't have any more time. Richard Branson doesn't have any more time. I mean, where time is allocated is really the key. And Warren Buffett once said that the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. And I share that because 
there is an opportunity cost to relationships. I mean, you have 1,440 minutes a day. Every minute spent interacting with people who don't serve you is not only time that you'll never get back, but it's ultimately saying no to somebody who would serve you, somebody who would support you, somebody who would energize you. You want to surround yourself with people who are batteries and not black holes. For the old school video gamers out there, the way I look at it is, is like this. Every day you wake up with a life bar that's 100%. Every time I send an email, I have a meeting, or I interact with a friend, I'm using up some of that life bar. And if you think of your days like that, you'll start to use your time differently. There's another thing to take into consideration here, which is, and I'll dig into this more in a future episode of the season, but you need to, I guess, accept the fact that from an evolutionary perspective, we have a cognitive limitation to the number of relationships that we can have. So although physical time is a serious factor, even if you had all the time in the world, you are still limited by the fact that your brain can only have approximately 150 stable social relationships. This number has been confirmed countless times through research, history, and science. Now, one thing I want to make clear before I jump to my last point is that there's a common misconception that when you subscribe to prioritizing certain relationships over others, that it's often based purely on where people land on the, I guess, the totem pole of success. And that is not the case at all. One of my principles when it comes to relationship building is that you should invest in people like you would invest in a business because amazing people become increasingly amazing over time. The people that I eliminate without question are those who are toxic, those that are inauthentic, those that operate from a transactional scarcity mindset, these are non-negotiables for me. This doesn't imply that all my relationships are easy. I have mentors that have high standards for me, that higher standards than I really have for myself, and they force me to stretch, and that's incredibly uncomfortable. There's also people who I choose to have in my life because I know I can learn something from them, or they force my character to kind of grow at its outward edge. Sometimes you have an opportunity to really make your tormentors your mentors. And Ram Dass once said that when you know how to listen, anyone can be your guru. So I don't have just easy relationships in my life. But again, I'm very conscious as to who I have relationships with. The third thing that I want to share is that the human brain is easy prey for influencers. There's a saying that I came across many years ago, which was before you diagnose yourself with depression or low self-esteem, I'm laughing because I remember posting this Facebook and a lot of people were agreeing with it. So before you diagnose yourself with depression or low self-esteem, first, make sure that you are not in fact surrounded by assholes. Now we are definitely deeply influenced by those around us. Researchers from Arizona State University of Human Evolution and Social Change have found that obesity can be contagious. People who have a higher number of obese friends or relatives are at a greater risk of becoming obese themselves. Friends, as they state, are likely to share similar eating habits and hobbies, which will influence their weight. Having overweight friends can make people see their weight as normal and eat accordingly until they are the same size. This is because, according to researchers, we learn about acceptable body size from family and friends. Most Marines have the highest standard they will ever have while in the Marines, and the reason for that is because people's lives are a direct reflection of the expectations of their peer group. Your peer group is made up of people in your life who you care deeply about how they feel about you. Whoever that group of people are, they exude an enormous amount of influence on you whether you're conscious of it or not. And you need to be conscious of your peer group again because proximity is power. If you have friends that have a lower standard than you have for your life, two things will happen. Oftentimes, these things happen simultaneously. The first thing is your standards will unconsciously lower, not because you want low standards for your life, but because you don't want friction with these people all the time. So eventually, you make low standards okay for them. And when you make it okay for them, a part of it makes it slightly okay for you. And the next thing you know, your standards have dropped. The second thing is that when you have a peer group that has lower standards or expectations than what you have, they are going to try to bring you down on some level subtly, and not because they are bad people, but because they quite simply have, again, a lower set of expectations for themselves. So now there's a gap and they don't want to lose you. 
So they will nicely or not so nicely bring you back down to earth. And they may say, you know, a cheat day isn't going to kill you. I think you should stay at that job or don't worry, you have plenty of time. I mean, these words are often spoken by people with very low standards. And I was, you know, I was in a relationship with someone who saw it as her role to quote unquote, bring me back down to earth anytime I received praise publicly. So if your expectations of life or your expectations of yourself are higher than your peer group, you're faced with three options. Lift them, love them, or leave them. Lift them by raising them to your new standards, which is not always easy, but is possible. Love them, which means to accept them, which again can be a slippery slope because unconsciously you may drop to their level, or leave them. And that doesn't mean burning bridges or having a come to Jesus talk saying that you're no longer, you know, they're not going to be in your life anymore, but be conscious as to where you allocate your time and distance yourself gracefully and gradually. I mean, there's a saying that God put people in your life for a reason and some for a season. People can stay in your heart. It doesn't mean that they have to stay in your life. You ultimately have that choice. Now, if you choose to leave one person, that's one thing. If you choose to leave a whole peer group, that's something else. I mean, for many people, making a major shift in their peer group is a necessity, and that can be a defining moment. It was for me. I mean, there's not a single relationship I have outside of the relationship with my wife that's over five years old. Again, it's tough. It's uncomfortable. And the, it, the reason for that, it's deep-rooted. And we have a deep need to belong and to feel accepted because, again, 10,000 years ago, if you didn't belong and weren't accepted within a tribe— you were guaranteed to die, right? You would either starve to death or get eaten by an animal that's that's bigger than you. So it's one of the only reasons why we survived as a species is our ability to kind of band together in numbers. And although our environment has changed, this need to belong is a survival mechanism buried deep in our subconscious that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So when you understand this, you can really kind of use it to your advantage on some level. I mean, for me, if I could boil down my success to one thing is that I've always surrounded myself with people who are one or two steps ahead of me. The model I've always kind of subscribed to is that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I constantly try to surround myself with people who make me feel uncomfortable on some level because that discomfort forces me to grow unconsciously as quickly as possible to fill the gap between where I am and where they are. Growth begins at the end of your comfort zone. I mean, why do people go to Chili's or Applebee's when visiting a new city? Because we don't want to rock the boat, right? We don't want to step outside that comfort zone. And changing your tribe, you know, is ultimately it's uncomfortable. Surrounding yourself with people who are one or two steps ahead of you is uncomfortable. But I'll tell you, I mean, get comfortable with the uncomfortable because unfaced fears become your limits. As Brene Brown says, choose courage over comfort. Surround yourself with people who make you feel uncomfortable because if you do, it's a great indication that it's forcing you to grow. Because when we choose to surround ourselves with people who are playing at a level, you know, or two above us, unconsciously it drives us to strive to get to that level as soon as possible as we don't like being an outcast. So in future episodes, I will share how to upgrade your tribe and ultimately how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. But I want to leave you with a fun little exercise. And I believe I learned this through my buddy, James Altucher. Jim Rohn famously said, he said, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So look at your social media accounts or the last couple of weeks of your calendar. Who are the five people you spend the most time with? How is their health? Rate their general health and fitness on a scale of one to 10 and add that up. How about their wealth? Write down their salaries or the size of their businesses and add that up. Their happiness, rate their overall happiness individually on a scale of one to 10, add it up. Relationships, how is the relationship with themselves, relationship with their spouse, relationship with their kids? Rate those on a scale of one to 10 and add it up. Now divide those numbers by five. The sum of those numbers, oftentimes it's surprising. It can be incredibly accurate to where your personal baseline is. You can't change the people around you, but you can change the people you are around. Who you surround yourself with is who you become. So choose wisely. Hey. So that's it. 
for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. Join me on the next episode of Community Made where I share why one of the highest leverage ways to build relationships is through live events, how to thrive in any group setting as an introvert, and I share my battlefield-tested post-event follow-up process, which includes capturing, capitalizing, closing, and checking in. Events often have the power to deliver a disproportionate amount of value for the investment made. Almost every time looking back, someone has helped me overcome an obstacle, opened a door of opportunity, or made a profound introduction. It's happened because I originally connected with that person at a live event in the past. With that said, if you're not seeing an ROI from events, you're either attending the wrong events or you're not leveraging them to their full potential. For show notes and any additional resources mentioned in this episode, visit the Community Made group. If you're not a member, it's free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. In there, we give away free books, host special trainings, and live Q&As. Also, this season is just filled with additional resources like checklists and stuff like that. And the only way to get access to that is via the group. So again, visit communitymade.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Nothing would make me happier than to hear your thoughts or biggest takeaways. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Jason Gaynard, J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D or email me at Jason, J-A-Y-S-O-N at communitymade.com. Before I go, I got to give a quick shout out to Gordy Bufton, my man Gordy from Scottsdale, Arizona for leaving the following review on Facebook. He said, Jason is one of the most connected men on the planet. I appreciate it. I don't think that's the case, but uh, I appreciate it regardless. He's able to ask the questions and have the conversations most of us would only dream about. I'm just grateful he shares so many of these conversations with the world. Always well worth the time invested. Thank you, Gordy, for the review, my friend. For the rest of you out there, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and like what we're doing here at Community Made, I would be forever grateful if you would share this podcast with your friends or leave an honest review on either iTunes or on Facebook, just like Gordy did. I'll see you on the next episode of Community Made. Enjoy your week.